have you learned from or been inspired by to cruise? Yeah, it's, it's lots of people actually. Yeah. Um, there's so many great books written on the subject. We have two great sailors in Denmark, uh, Trolls Kløvedal is one of them. Very, very famous in Denmark. Uh, made fantastic voyages around the world on a budget of almost zero. Collected glass bottles uh, and sold them in some harbors to earn money to buy the, the food uh, for dinner. So uh, in the beginning of his voyage, it's a very, very small budget. Uh, Sven Billesbølle, also a Danish sailor, he was in his 70s when he did his third circumnavigation in an 18 feet sailing boat alone. Uh, very, very inspiring. And then um, I've been very inspired by Lynn and Larry Party. Oh, yeah. Uh, has made uh, some amazing videos on, on the cruising life and how to make it simple, make it small, uh, and make the best out of it. They really showed me how many possibilities there are right in front of your nose. Um, and how small improvements, small investments, small inventions can make all the difference to your cruising life. So what about food? What do you eat when you're offshore sailing single-handed? Actually, I eat pretty much the same as back home. Yeah? Yeah. I like a warm, nice meal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got time to cook it. So, uh, so that's pretty much the same. Do you enjoy cooking when you're offshore? Uh, that depends. Yeah, on the weather <laughs> in, in a In a half gale, uh, I don't enjoy it as much as in a calm, but um, yeah, I like it. I like it. So there's no difference really between home and here? No, no. Um. I bake bread and uh, yeah, I cook, yeah, I do almost, almost like home. Huh. But when I sail long distances offshore, I, I often feel like being in a kind of uh, meditation or so so often um, I feel disturbed that I have to cook mm. or I have to do the dishwashing or I have to navigate or I have to trim the sails. Mm. Some, sometimes it actually f um, feels like it's disturbing really? my, my peace of mind. Mm. But I have to cook and when I, when I do I can just as well make a nice meal mm. than, <laughs> than something boring to eat. So. Is it an alcohol stove? It's an alcohol stove, alcohol yes. Stove. Yes. It used to be a propane stove, but I threw it out really? first Why? thing when I get got back with the boat. I don't like having explosives aboard. Mm -hmm. But I have um, I have an outboard engine. Um, so I have to, to carry 110 liters of, of petrol. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of... Yeah. of uh, flammable explosive yeah. fuel to carry so I don't want to to add propane also gas and propane yeah gas and propane so where, where do you store your gasoline is it on deck in no it's or? uh it's in uh, in, in tanks uh, under the cockpit okay. so and it's, it's it's pretty safe of course and mm -hmm. but uh, I don't like the, the thought to think of too much about it. Yeah. <laughs> Roger Taylor is um, one of the sailors that has inspired me the most. He's into the concept of simple sailing. Very, very, very simple sailing. He's an awesome writer and can write hundreds of pages about the sea. So it's, it's like being aboard yourself. Yeah. And that's really great. What I like especially about him and his ideas yeah. is the idea of getting small and getting simple. Um, the go small, go simple, go now idea. He sails in, uh, in this 19 feet uh, Cory B with a junk rig. He has a wind vane and a small handheld GPS which he switches on once a day at noon and checks his position because he has no electricity except the one small solar panel, two um, LED lights, navigational lights, so that's it. On a 19 foot? In a 19 foot 
junk rigs. Junk rigs, Caribbean. And he has done amazing voyages all over the world. He started when he was young, sailing um, in New Zealand, uh, Australia, and uh, now he's sailing in the North Atlantic, actually in the, the area where I my cruising ground is. And I think if someone lives the freedom equation, mm -hmm. it's him. Because yeah. it's very, very cheap, very, very simple, and he gets so much out of it every summer where he goes on a long, long cruise and sails thousands of miles within six, seven weeks. Oh, he sails a lot. Yeah, in a lot. Short time. very, very lot. Yeah, he never goes ashore during his uh, sails. He, he leaves, for instance, Scotland, and then he sails for seven weeks, and then he's back home in White Hills, Scotland, and that's it. After seven weeks at sea, seven he weeks comes at back sea home. In his 19-foot uh, Caribbean. And he's written all about his voyages. Yeah. I would like to go ashore and see the places I actually pass on my voyage, so that, that's yeah. not what I would like to do, but I understand him because of the peace of mind. It's like being in a monastery for for seven weeks, uh, and I think that's just great. Uh, <laughs> and it's for almost nothing. Then he, he, he uh, tows up his boat, put it on a trailer, and drive back home in the vicinity of London, I think he, yeah. he lives. So it can be, he can actually have his boat on a trailer, so he, it's that he doesn't pay for, <laughs> uh, pay the fee for being in a harbor or anything. He can have it in his backyard wow. during the winter. No marinas, no boat No marinas, yards. nothing. It's very, very, very simple and very cheap, yet a lot more adventurous and a lot more giving for him, I think. Mm. Um, than most boat owners get from their big, expensive yachts. So um, it's really inspiring. But of course I won't copy him because I would like to go ashore, so I would prefer to have an engine mm -hmm. so I can control my boat close to, to shore, shores and stuff like that. But the way of thinking, the freedom equation, oh, wow. that's really what he, what he does. Roger Taylor, I'm looking forward to to learning more about him and maybe reading you, you his books. You should definitely read his books. They're great. All of them. So, yeah. Do. Yeah, do you Please think do. you'll ever meet him? Do no. <laughs> maybe someday. Yeah. If he's sailing in, in your waters. Yeah. It would be, it would be yeah, but he's, he's not easy to meet because he never he sees never the shore. So <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps like a wave and we pass each other. <laughs> That's about it. How about heavy weather and what's the worst that you've ever seen? I've actually never sailed in extreme weather. I, of course, I try to avoid it. And uh, the voyages I've made uh, haven't been longer than I could almost predict the weather. Mm -hmm. For four day, four or five days mm -hmm. in advance, you know approximately how it will be. And I, of course, I try to avoid it because it's dangerous. I have sailed once in 42 knots of wind or so uh, in in Denmark uh, at Kattegat, which was which was a thrilling experience. I loved it, uh, and there's something there's something inside me, some forbidden place inside me that tells me that it would be great to experience a storm at sea and survive. Oh my God. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I feel the same. If I actually experience it someday, sure. I don't think I would. I will. But I am thrilled by the the powers of the, the power of the the nature and to feel it in the in the, in the rigging and the hull and the, all these uh, all this power is 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 great. And I feel well prepared if it if it should come to a, a, a gale or storm. Uh, how is your boat prepared for the heavy weather? Um, I've strengthened the rigging. Um, I've added a, a, a baby shroud. Do you call that a baby shroud? Yeah. I have changed the mainsail so I can um, reef it to a very, very small size, mm -hmm. like a trysail. I have a storm jib that I can attach outside the furling headsail so yeah. I don't have to take it down. 
for very extreme conditions, I have my Don Jordan series stroke with heavy chain plates. It takes up a lot of space. It's very heavy, but um, I wouldn't go anywhere uh, on the oceans in the North Atlantic, at least, without it, because. I have read so much about people really being happy about it. I think that's the best solution, mm -hmm. as far as I've researched, mm -hmm. that can uh, for, for a boat in really extreme weather conditions. But I will probably never have to use it. But I think it's... I, I, I like having it because it improves the whole experience mm -hmm. for me. It, it makes the whole experience a lot better because I feel safe all the time. Yeah. So it's this long, this broad, this high and it weighs 20 kilos or so. But I like having it because I feel, I feel secure. I feel like, okay, perhaps, perhaps it will blow a lot. Perhaps the seas will get enormous, and but I know what to do, and I know what to do next, yeah. and I want know what to do next and next and next. Yeah. I know I have many, many, many steps yeah. to go before disaster. So that's a way of bringing disaster at a nice distance to you in your in your mind, mm. um, and so I can relax and enjoy, even if it gets windy and rough and wet and cold and everything it's just well i have i have yet seven steps to go before disaster so no problem so i like that that's that's how i think about preparing yourself for heavy weather you shouldn't you shouldn't be at sea in heavy weather no. if you can avoid it you, you shouldn't can avoid it stay stay at in, in port until you have a nice and secure weather window but you get a better voyage and you relax a lot more if you are prepared for, for the worst thing you can ever encounter mm -hmm. uh, at sea. So well, that's, that's how I, I think. It's amazing. We, we spend so much time preparing our boats for the worst situations that may never yeah. happen. And yet yeah. so much energy goes into yeah. preparing for that one yeah. thing. I spent the whole winter upgrading this boat for storm conditions, yeah. and I will never, ever encounter storm conditions Hopefully. the way uh, the way I sail. A lot less than one percentage of yeah. of uh, possibility that I will ever encounter the weather this boat is prepared for. And yet I spent eighty percent of the preparation for this voyage preparing for exactly that. And that brings you the sort of raises your confidence and comfort level. Yes. Yes, and that's a and that's the purpose. Can you tell me more about the Jordan series drone and how it works? If you get into a situation where you have to deploy it, yeah. how would you do that? Theoretically, be very easy to launch. Um, I have it in a big bag mm -hmm. out there. You can carry it to the cockpit pretty easily. Attach it to uh, to two very very strong chain plates. I mounted on both sides of the boat. Aye. Um, you could actually lift the boat in these chain plates if you wanted to. So, <laughs> did you install those chain plates only for the drone? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they are actually uh, made for for a lot bigger boats than this one. And then I just drop the chain in the end of the drogue into the water, and it will launch itself from the back. And minutes later, I will be safe and. Safe and sound. So it's off, yeah. it goes off the stern. Yeah. yeah, from the stern, yes. And the idea is that you that you sail with the weather, mm -hmm. thus taking some of the power out of it. The seas from from behind will throw you forward, but when they do, the the chain in the end of the the tail of the um, the drogue will lift. Um, and then more of the cones, it's a long rope with some hundred cones on it. More of the cones will be active when, when it lifts, when it's thrown this way and break the boat. And, and when, then when, when the, the sea has passed, it will drop again. So you will have a very smooth and organic way of getting, getting stopped all the time. Strains on the boat will be a lot less uh, than an ordinary. Uh, parachute or what would you might use. 
but I haven't tried in uh, in real life. You haven't, uh, yeah. Roger Taylor has, and uh, a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and writes about it, and that's uh, among lots of others. Really? Uh, what inspired me to get exactly that that piece of equipment, and I think um, his description of of how it works for him yeah. in a storm, I think, was close to Iceland, it was very convincing. I think. What's your favorite piece of gear when it comes to offshore sailing? What are you really glad that I you think, have? I think my favorite piece of gear is the gear I need in the situation. Mm. It depends on the situation I'm in. Yeah. Um, so I like to have a lot of gear. A lot <laughs> lots of gear because I like, I, I, I really like to have exactly the right equipment for the situation I'm in. Mm. When offshore sailing single-handed I love my wind vane. That's absolutely my favorite because it it does the job for me. I can relax. I never steer the boat for one minute when I'm off single-handed. The wind vane does it. If I get a, into a, a calm, I love my engine. It has um, moved the boat for thousands of miles uh, during the last seven, eight years. It never fails. I hope, but I love it. And my autopilot in calms also. It's so boring to steer a boat in a calm. I just love to to have the right equipment. I can't imagine some equipment that I miss um, on, on on this boat. I think I've been traveling a lot with this boat now. I've got a lot of cruising, and for every voyage I make, I add a little equipment. Hmm. So it's not simple sailing anymore. Mm. Mm. Far from it's getting more and more, more and more complicated. <laughs> um, so I'm far from the idea of Roger Taylor and and Lynn and Larry party, and I have a lot to repair, and I repair all the time. But I really feel that it's great to have all this equipment for all situations. And dense fog, I switch on my radar, and I love it. And mm. So that's what I think about equipment. My love changes <laughs> with the circumstances. What was your longest voyage? In a row, or yeah, a, yeah, a, a long, or, longest time at sea between stopping? Yeah, that was when I sailed back home from the Shetland Islands yeah. five years ago, single-handed. Um, it was from Lervik to Gothenburg in Sweden, where I was to pick up the family. But I had a headwind all the way. Oh my God. Um, so it took uh, six days and there was a lot of traffic, a lot of shipping lanes I had to cross, so I didn't get much sleep. When I say long distances alone, I sleep 15 minutes a time and then, and then I'm awakened and uh, I have a timer waking me up every 15 minutes to have a look, trim the sails uh, and uh, go back to sleep. Where do you usually sleep when you're single-handed and offshore? You know, on, on this, in this right. berth. I have a pilot berth here. I can, okay. um, yeah. And where is your alarm? I always put it so I have to get out of the berth. You have to, to get to, out to of kill it. it. Yeah. So you don't keep it with you. No. You can just turn because it that's off too on. dangerous. Yeah. I, I have to. I have to be forced to get out of. And you keep it on the. Yeah, it's over in the, there. Uh, in the navigation table. So, so the yeah. alarm goes off. Yeah. And yeah. It's only been 15 minutes. Yeah, I figured out that when I I sailed from Aarhus here to the Faroe Islands, uh, it took me 10 days. Uh, I had three nights in port, but all the other nights I was sailing. So from Aarhus to here, I got awakened 200 times. It's quite a lot. Every 15 minutes. Yeah, but actually it was kind of luxury because there was almost no uh, no shipping. Yeah. On the on the route, so if if I can just get awakened every 15 minutes, get up, have a look, yeah. go back to sleep again immediately, then actually it's no problem. It's not it's not comfortable, but it's it's okay. But if it's very often when I look around that there are some ships I have to yeah. to uh, keep track of, or and so I have to stay awake until they have passed me. Then it's really tough. On this six days voyage from. Uh, from Lovig to Gothenburg, there was a lot of shipping, uh, shipping lanes and so on. So 
I was so, so tired. The last night uh, crossing Kattegat I couldn't sleep at all because there were all kind of fishing vessels and cruising ships and freighters and everything. So yeah, so when I finally got to Gothenburg I cried once more. Ah! But that was not from joy or <laughs> happiness or anything. I, and it was not because I was sad or relieved or anything. I was just so tired. So <laughs> I just cried yourself <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> I was completely done. Yeah. Do you ever set the timer for less than 15 minutes? Like, are you ever in a situation where you just need to sleep, but you can't really be down for that long? Do you ever yeah. Sleep? Yeah. Sometimes if I see a ship approaching, then with my AIS or the radar or both, I can see how far it is and how fast it moves and then I can, for instance, say, okay, I have seven minutes before this will be a problem and then I go for seven minutes. It's better, th better than nothing. Right. I've also tried, when I sailed to here, when I uh, sailed in the North Atlantic between Shetland Islands and here, there was absolutely no ships. Uh, for one and a half day I didn't see one single ship. So I decided, well, I can sleep for an hour now. I think it would be safe because for the, the last 10 hours I have not seen one ship, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. But that's actually even worse than getting awakened every 15 minutes. Really? Because you get into to deep sleep. So um, you, you get awakened after having slept for one hour, you almost can't wake up and you feel sick, yeah. uh, really. So, so it was not a good idea. To sleep longer. No, no, no. 20, 25 minutes will be the best, I think. If the alarm goes off and you get up and you go through your checking routine, and if everything is going well and no ships and the boat's doing well, what's the shortest amount of time you're actually up before you go back to sleep? It's a minute. One minute? Yeah. In that amount of time, I don't think you quite come out of being in a very restful state and then mm. just go right back in. To me, it's it's fine. I'm completely awake when the timer is, yeah. is waking me up uh, and I fall to sleep immediately yeah. again. But again, I think it's important to, to, um, to stick to these 15 minutes, not yeah. more. Because then we will, you will need half an hour to get awake and then, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> but but um, you never you never go too deep in your sleep in the 15 minutes. So one minute is okay to just have a look around, perhaps check the radar. If it's very dark, I use the radar too. Discover uh, unlit objects. Is the course okay? Um, how's the wind? You can do a lot in, in a minute. And then back to my must, uh, sleep. I often have a hard time falling asleep, but it's 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 interesting to think about getting into this routine of waking up every 15 minutes, and then yeah. and you said that you go back to sleep immediately. So it must be yeah. interesting to get back in bed and lie there and know that you are going to be asleep yeah. in the next 30 yeah. seconds. <laughs> but I think it's also a question of, of being tired enough. Yeah. That, that, that solves most sleeping problems. That you just have to be, you, <laughs> you just have to be so extremely tired that you, <laughs> you can't do anything else but sleep. Would it be okay for us to look at your boat? Yeah. Can you give us a tour? Yeah. Wonderful.